Well, the title of my sermon is Been There, Done That. How many of you have ever shared that phrase before? Yeah. Been there, done that. You know, what's, what's assumed with that is been there, done that, don't plan to do it again, right? It, it, isn't that what we mean by that? It usually is, yeah. Been there, done that, I sure hope I don't have to do that again. Yeah. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, uh, in my life, I've owned two motorcycles, okay? Been there, done that. Both of them put me in the hospital. Don't want to go there again. <laughs> <laughs> that may be why you will never see me owning another motorcycle. I can think of, uh, let's see, although I'm going back to Alaska this year. A couple of years ago, I went to Alaska, done that. I've been there, done that, fell off the sidewalk, broke three ribs, don't want to do that again. You know? um, I, I think my biggest one is Peggy and I raised three children, including twins, all the way to adulthood. <laughs> been there, done that. You get the point. <laughs> okay. So you know what we're talking about when we're talking about been there and done that. But when it comes to things such as our spiritual practices or our healthy practices, been there, done that doesn't work. My sermon is about the importance of repeating the practices of prayer, presence, gifts, service, and witness until we get good at them. And then continuing to do them so that we are always doing them well and not letting them slip. Uh, you've heard the phrase, I'm sure, practice makes perfect, right? Um, being there, doing that, and continuing to improve along the way is practice made perfect. It's a part of what it is to walk the Christian walk. The definition of disciple in the Bible includes the assumption that this disciple is a follower of Jesus who continues to seek to learn more from Christ every day. And now, these 2,000 years later, we are the disciples. And we are called upon to be people who seek to learn every day. We never, we, we never stop seeking to improve. Actually, our life becomes a culture of improvement. Living better tomorrow than we're living this day as we seek to walk more faithfully with Jesus as each day comes and goes. It's not something you do occasionally, but it's something that becomes a way of life. It's not about being a good moral citizen. It's about being a faithful person who does everything they can to practice the things of faith so that they get better and better at what they do. And in the process, we then become very recognizable to the rest of the world around us as Christian. Well, tomorrow is Memorial Day, and many people will be going to Memorial Day observances somewhere, uh, perhaps nearby or far away. Uh, the, the biggest celebration in the Hillsboro Pinellas County area is going to be at um, Bay Pine National Cemetery, which is over in St. Pete. Um, they have decorated 34,000 graves of veterans there with American flags. The ceremony expects to, uh, in, to include uh, more than 30,000 uh, people coming, or, th or 3,000 people coming to that particular event. Tarpon Springs does it up big also. Yesterday they had the Boy Scout troops in town decorating all the graves of the veterans at Cicada Park. Uh, Cicada Cemetery, and there at the park next door to it, they're going to have their big ceremony. Our ceremony here in town is going to be hosted by the American Legion. It will be at the American Legion building. It's at 11 o'clock tomorrow morning, for if any of you want to attend that. Now, with all of those different kinds of, of observances and celebrations, uh, something that I did not know until I went researching this earlier this week was, did you know that all Americans are urged on Monday of Memorial Day 
at three o'clock in the afternoon to pause whatever it is that you were doing so that you can take a moment to remember. Did you know that that was a part of our, it's supposed to be part of our American tradition. It doesn't look like many of you knew that, huh? But back in 2000, former President Bill Clinton uh, signed into law a proclamation that said, let us do that because we tend to be forgetting what Memorial Day is all about. In his proclamation, he wrote this, all Americans can come together to recognize how fortunate we are to live in freedom. The National Moment of Remembrance, that's what it's called, three o'clock tomorrow afternoon. The National Moment of Remembrance is a simple and unifying way to commemorate the sacrifices made by those who served and died. Why do we celebrate Memorial Day? For that matter, why do we celebrate the 4th of July and Veterans Day? Well, the reason we do it is to remember. We want to remember the value and the importance of freedom. We want to remember the cost of freedom. And we want to remember the valor of all of those who have served our country through the military through all of these years. Because if we don't observe those kinds of days, if we don't remember them and practice the holidays, we just might forget the cost of freedom. And we surely don't want to do that. Well, the same is true of our faith walk. That's why we as Christians celebrate Christmas. That's why we will never forget Easter. That's why uh, almost monthly, or, or at least monthly, we celebrate Holy Communion. And that's why every Sunday we show up here for worship. These are some of the practices of the faith, and we do them lest we forget. We cannot forget the basics of our faith. And that also includes the things that I've been talking about since the 1st of January, these things called healthy practices and fruitful practices. We must continue to rehearse those or practice those if we plan to grow deeper in the things of Jesus. If you plan to live out what it means to be a person of faith, then you need to practice the things of our faith. The Great Commission of Jesus states, go and make disciples. Marilyn read that earlier today. Go and make disciples. Now, we usually think about that as in uh, the making of believers. The reason we do is probably because we understand that the words immediately following, go and make disciples, is and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That often recalls for us what it is to make believers. But I think Jesus was taking this scripture, or, or this, this uh, great commission, uh, to a deeper level. You know, there's a lot of believers out there, but not all of those believers follow Jesus Christ. They don't live their lives as if they are Christ followers. And so I think what Jesus was saying in Go and Make Disciples, he was saying, go and make people who believe and follow. You know, those who emulate the life of Christ. Yeah. Go and, and help develop the children of God into the followers of the Jesus. Yeah. Because when we are able to do that, or when we do that, we then walk as real witnesses in the faith. To do that well, we need to practice the lifestyle that Jesus led. I want to remind us that the Great Commission begins with the words, go and make disciples, and it ends with these words, go and teach them everything that I have commanded you. Become believers, and then the, learn the way of Jesus. Well, it's time for me to introduce to you another book. It's called The Five Practices of Fruitful Living. 
It continues with the theme that we've been talking about all spring and now into the summer, ever since January. These five fruitful practices, notice they're fruitful practices, help strengthen and give backbone to our other five healthy practices, the prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness ones. Uh, this new book that was written about three or four years ago is becoming a call to transformation in the United Methodist Church. It was written by one of our bishops, Robert Shanisi, and it is just packed full of some incredible wisdom on what it is to grow ourselves as Christians in the 21st century. For us here at this church, it's going to be a part of the foundation that we are building as we seek to become the church God needs us to become as we move forward into our future. The author of that book writes this. Christian practices, and we, prayers, presence, gifts, service, witness, those are the first five practices. These relate to that. These give strength and backbone to it, these practices here. He says as Christian practices are those essential activities we repeat and deepen over time. They create openings for God's Spirit to shape us. They are not steps we complete and put behind us, never to repeat again. Practices are not simply principles we talk about. Practices are something we do. A few weeks ago, some of us were sitting around here at the church and talking about the study that many of us had just finished going through from that original book called A Disciple's Path. Um, that was a study in which we talked about how do we incorporate into our lives and our hearts prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. And, and we were, we, one of the things that we had asked the classes to do and the small groups to do uh, and the leadership team to do was to immerse themselves in that material for at least 12 weeks. Yeah, and many folks did participate in that and were a big part of that. Yeah. The goal was to help you embrace and come to understand how important it is to develop a lifestyle of faith. You know, not just to be a good church person, but to be a person who walks the walk and talks the talk 24-7, uh, 365. That was, that's our goal, and that continues to be our goal. That's what we want for you, and that's what we want for you to get. That's what we want for you to pick up. Well, someone asked a question as we were gathering around, just chatting about all of the stuff that had been going on. Someone asked the question, okay, what's next? Uh, what they were asking was, okay, our group is finished with that study yeah. uh, concerning the, the five... Um, healthy practices, what we had been calling the membership vows of the Methodist Church, prayers, presence, gifts, service, witness. Uh, we're done with that. Now, what do you have next for us to offer? Yeah. And with that, I got thinking, you know, what I'm hearing of that class is we've been there, done that. We've been there, done that. Let's shelve that and move on to something else. And I got thinking, you know, that's not what this is all about. Yeah. It's not about finishing some kind of process or a step forward and then just ignoring it. Yeah. So, I, so I asked the question of those of us who were gathering around. Let me ask you this. Has your small group, um, have you noticed that the lifestyle of members of your small group has changed significantly? What I mean by that is, uh, has their prayers not only transformed who they are as people, but revolutionized their lives? Yeah. When they come for worship, do they come more deeply now expecting to experience God here? Or do they come just hoping to experience friendships with buddies? Yeah. Uh, with, with gifts and service and witness? Yeah. Are, are, they, are they living a lifestyle of faith more so now than they had been in the past? Are you living a lifestyle of faith now 
more than you had been living it in the past. And if not, then you really haven't been there and done that in the first place. Perhaps all that you've really done is you've just studied another biblical curriculum. And if that's all that you've done, then it's such an incredible waste of time. And that's really not what we are about. There is so much more to it than that. And so I hope that you become aware of that and embrace that as you move through the rest of this year. No, as you move through the rest of your life. Because we're talking about lifestyle change. Our goal is not just to complete another church study of some kind. Our goal is to completely change our culture and what it means to be a Christian. Our goal is to embrace these fruitful practices and these healthy practices in passionate ways, in intentional ways, in ways that are risky and radical and extravagant. Why? Because we need to become a different church now than we were 50 years ago or 100 years ago. Why? Because the 21st century has become a period of unbelief for Americans. I can't speak for the rest of the world, but here in America, it has become an age of unbelief. And the church needs to take that back. And we need to be a part of the leadership to do that. Now, let me um, tweak a little bit the theme of this sermon. You know, been there, done that. All right. I want to add to it this time. I want to kind of do a little reversal here. And been that, or, or, or been there, done that, want to do it again. Okay. Not been there, done that, don't want to do it again. This time it's been there done that, want to do it again. And I'm going to ask some, some of you to share, you know, if you want to share. Um, let, let me begin by sharing with you what I mean, okay? I have grandkids in Ohio and in Alaska. I have been there, Ohio and Alaska. I have done that, given them little guys a bunch of hugs. Yeah. I want to do it again. Yeah. I want to do it so bad. We haven't seen some of these kids for six months, you know? And I got another one on the way. I got a fourth one on the way. Yeah. I want to be there, do that, and do it again. Th- think of the things in your life that you want to repeat. Yeah. Those, what's that that you want to practice again and again and again? That's what I'm talking about here. Uh, Peggy's family, that's the, the Welch clan and the Buckaloo clan, they all get together for a week-long family reunion. Most of us, when we get together with families for family reunions, we can barely stand each other for four or five hours. But Peggy's side of the family, they get together for seven days. We've been there, done that, and I so look forward to going to West Virginia this summer to do that again. Because it is such an important part of our, our identity of who we are. And for me, as a part of this church, My been there, done that, and want to do it again includes coming back here Sunday after Sunday to preach the gospel message and to to do everything that I can to help you get it, to help you understand how important it is to live a life of faith that is transforming in the world around you. And that includes for all of us to decide that these healthy practices and these fruitful practices are worth committing to and doing again and again and forever as we seek to build a culture of transformation in the life of this church. In both of those scripture passages for today, the Great Commission and the first one really announces the Great Commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. Those are such powerful and important words for the church to hear anew. 
because the world beyond these doors have forgotten that. The only way we're going to be able to re-teach that is if it becomes embedded in our hearts like never before. So are you with me in that? I hope you are. I hope so. Let's bow for a prayer.